the Prince of Preachers. One of his contemporaries said that the chief secret of Spurgeon's attractiveness was the fact that, in every sermon, no matter what the text or the occasion, he explained the way of salvation in simple terms. C. H. Spurgeon preached this message on August 23, 1857, at the Music Hall of the Royal Surrey Gardens. The text is found in Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 12. Yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before Him. I believe that David uttered a great truth as well as a great exhortation to himself when he said, "Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. There is nothing in man that God has put there which may not be employed in God's service." Some may ask me whether anger can be brought in. I answer, yes. A good man may serve God by being angry against sin, and to be angry against sin is a high and holy thing. You may ask me, perhaps, whether ridicule can be employed. I answer, yes. I believe we may even rightly employ it in the preaching of God's word. I know this. I always intend to use it, and if by a laugh I can make men see the folly of an error better than in any other way. They shall laugh and laugh here too, for ridicule is to be used in God's service. And every power that God hath implanted in man, I will make no exception, may be used for God's service and for God's honor. Faith can do anything, but fear, sinful fear, can just do nothing at all, but even prevent faith from performing its labors. There is first the fear caused by an awakening conscience. This is the lowest grade of godly fear. Here, all true piety takes its rise. By nature, the sinner does not dread the wrath of God. He thinks sin a little thing. He looks upon its pleasures and forgets its penalty. He dares the Almighty to the war and lifts his puny arm against the Eternal. No sooner, however, is he awakened by God's Spirit than fear takes possession of his heart. The arrows of the Almighty drink up his spirit. The thunders of the law roll in his ears. He feels his life to be uncertain and his body frail. He dreads death because he knows that death would be to him the prelude of destruction. He dreads life, for life itself is intolerable when the wrath of God is poured out into his soul. Why, man, there have been some that have sunk far deeper than thou hast sunk. Thou art up to thy ankles. I have known some to have been up to the loins, and there have been some that have been covered over their very heads. So that they could say, "All thy waves and thy billows have gone over me." I am no general redemptionist. I believe Jesus Christ died for as many as will be saved. I do not believe He died in vain for any man alive. I have always believed that Christ was punished instead of men. Now, if He were punished in the stead of all men, I could see no justice in God punishing men again after having punished Christ for them. I hold and believe, and I think on scriptural authority, that Jesus Christ died for all those who believe or will believe, and He was punished in the stead of all those who feel their need of a Savior and lay hold on Him. There are many who have believed and are truly converted, who have a fear which I may call the fear of anxiety. They are afraid that they are not converted. They are converted. There is no doubt of it. Sometimes they know they are so themselves, but for the most part they are afraid. There are some people in the world who have a preponderance of fear in their characters. It seems as if their mind, from its peculiar constitution, had a greater aptitude for the state of fear than for any other state. Why, even in temporal matters, they are always fearing, and when these poor souls get converted, they are always afraid that they are not so. First, they will tell you they are afraid that they never repented enough. The work in their hearts, they say, was not deep; it was just superficial surface plowing, and never entered into their souls. Then they are quite sure they never came to Christ aright. They think they came the wrong way. How that can be, no one knows, for they could not come at all except the Father drew them, and the Father did not draw them the wrong way. Still, they hold that they did not come aright. Then, if that idea is knocked on the head, they say they do not believe aright. But when that is got rid of, they say, if they were converted, they would not be the subject of so much sin. 
They say they can trust Christ, but they are afraid that they do not trust Him aright. And they always, do what you may, come back to the old condition. They are always afraid. And now, what shall I say to these good souls? Why, I will say this. Surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before Him. Not only those who believe, but those who fear have got a promise. I would to God that they had more faith. I would they could lay hold on the Savior, and had more assurance, and even attain unto a perfect confidence. But if they cannot, shall I utter a word that would hurt them? God forbid. Surely it shall be well, even with them that fear God, with them that fear before Him. There are some of these poor creatures who are the holiest and most heavenly-minded people in all the world. I have seen men who, with poor, desponding spirits, have exhibited the most lovely graces. There has not been the blushing, healthy beauty of the rose, but the lily hath its beauties, sickly though it seemeth, and these, though they be faint and weak, have eminently the graces of humility and meekness, of patience and endurance, and they practice more of meditation, more of self-examination, more of repentance, more of prayer than any race of Christians alive. God forbid that I should vex their spirits. There are some of God's best children who always grow in the shade of fear, and can scarcely attain to so much as to say, I know whom I have believed. Darkness seems to suit them best. Their eyes are weak, and much sunlight seems to blind them. They love the shadows. And though they thought they could sing, I know my Savior, I love Him, and He loves me, they go back again and begin to groan in themselves, Do I love the Lord? Indeed, if it be so, why am I thus? Now, I am about to utter a great paradox. I believe that some of these poor fearing people have got the greatest faith of anybody in the world. I have sometimes thought that great fear, great anxiety, must have great faith with it to keep the soul alive at all. See that man drowning. There, there is another in the water, too, I see. He, in the distance, thinks he can swim. A plank is thrown to him. He believes himself to be in no danger of sinking. Well, he clutches at the plank very leisurely and does not seem to grasp it firmly. But this poor creature here, he knows he cannot swim. He feels that he must soon sink. Now put the means of escape near him. How desperately he clutches it! How he seems as if he would drive his fingers through the plank! He clutches it for life or death. That is his all, for he must perish if he is not saved by that. Now, in this case, he that fears the most believes the most. And I do think it is so sometimes with poor desponding spirits. They have had the greatest fear of hell, and the greatest fear of themselves, and the greatest dread that they are not right. Oh, what a faith they must have when they are unable to throw themselves on Christ, and when they can but whisper to themselves, I think that he is mine. Surely I know it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before him. But I want to comfort these poor souls a little. I do not think a minister does well in killing the lambs. For where would be the sheep next year if he should do so? But at the same time, it is his business to make the lambs grow into sheep if he can. And you who are fearing, I would not say a word to hurt you, but I would say a word to comfort you if I could. I would remind you that you are not fit to judge of yourself. You have been just now examining yourself, and you came to the conclusion that you really are not a child of God. Now, you will not be offended with me, but I would not give one single farthing for your opinion of yourself. Why, I tell you, you have not any judgment. It is not long ago you were a base, presumptuous sinner, and then you thought yourself all right. I did not believe you then. Well, then you began to reform yourself. You practiced many good works and thought, surely you were mending your pace to heaven then. Then I knew you were wrong. Now you are becoming a true believer in Christ, but you are very fearful, and you say you are not safe. I know you are. You are not fit to judge. I should not like to see you elevated to the bench. You would scarcely know how to deal with other men, 
for you would not know how to deal with yourself. And who is he that can deal with himself? We sometimes think ourselves proud. We are never more humble than when we feel that we are proud. At other times, we think ourselves to be wonderfully humble, and we are never more proud than then. We sometimes say within ourselves, Now I think I am overcoming my corruptions. That is just the time when they are about to attack us most severely. At another time we are crying, Surely I shall be cut off. That is just the period when sin is being routed, because we are hating it the most and crying out the most against it. We are not qualified to judge ourselves. Our poor scales are so out of order that they will never tell the truth. Now then, just give up your own judgment, except thus far. Can you say that you are a poor sinner and nothing at all, and that Jesus Christ is your all in all? Then be comforted. You have no right to be anxious. You have no reason to be so. You could not say that if you had not been converted. You must have been quickened by grace, or else you would not be anxious at all. And you must have faith, or else you would not be able even to lay hold of Christ so much as to know your own nothingness and His all-sufficiency. Poor soul, be comforted. But shall I tell thee one thing? Dost thou know the greatest of God's people are often in the same condition as thou art now? No, no, says the fearing soul, I do not believe that. I believe that when persons are converted, they never have any fear. And they look at the minister, and they say, Oh, but if I could be but like that minister, I know he never has doubts and fears. Oh, if I could be like old deacon so-and-so, such a holy man, how he prays. Oh, if I could feel like Mr. So-and-so, who calls to visit me and talks to me so sweetly, they never doubt. Ah, that is because you do not know. Those whom you think to be the strongest and are so in public have their times of the greatest weakness when they can scarcely know their own names in spiritual things. If one may speak for the rest, those of us who enjoy the greatest portions of assurance have times when we would give all the world to know ourselves to be possessors of grace, when we would be ready to sacrifice our lives if we might but have a shadow of a hope that we were in the love of Jesus Christ our Lord. Fear will never kill anybody. Doubts and fears, said an old preacher once, are like the toothache, nothing more painful, but never fatal. They will often grieve us, but they will never kill us. They distress us much, but they will never burn the soul. Fears even do good at times. Let me not, however, praise them too much. I heard a preacher say the other day that fear was a good housekeeper. I said, so I have heard, but I do not believe it. She never will keep a cupboard full. She is a good doorkeeper. She can keep beggars and thieves away. She is a good house dog to guard us and protect us in the night and warn us of dangers lest we fall into them. The fear of anxiety, then, is a good fear. Take this promise. Surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before Him.